Good evening, and I'm delighted to be here. I actually thought I'd be speaking to an audience of around 50, uh, so I'm delighted to see that so many of you have stayed to the very end. It's an interesting title that Pat Daly asked me to speak about, Values, Behaviors, and Cultures. But I think as a member of this wonderful association, it's something that we all value. But there's something unique about the association, and I lived abroad for many years, and it was that to be able to put my hand on my chest and say that I'm a member of the GEA. I'm a part of a club. And that means something. And I'm very concerned over the last 10 or 15 years, we're, tending, we're starting to dilute some of what's unique about what has made us so special for 125 years. And I want to address some of those today. So I'm going to wear two hats today. The first hat is going to be me as a coach. And I'm going to put from the sports science coaching perspective. But I believe more importantly, because of things that are changing in the association, I'm going to wear my academic hat and I'm going to talk about public health implications. Why it's so important that we keep our kids involved in playing our games. And there isn't a value you can put on that, I can rest assure you. So if we take what determines whether a child or any individual will become an excellent performer, there are three things. One is your genes. And I can tell you, you can't put in what God left out. You get your genes, that's it. The second thing is your age. That can determine how you perform. And the third is the environment and your lifestyle. That's where you come in as the coach. You create the environment in which these genes at a certain age are going to be expressed. You create the culture within your club. That's what you do. And, and you play an extremely important role in doing that and also in, in ensuring that these kids develop a healthy lifestyle. And it's how all of these three things interact. That is ultimately how any individual will perform. So, that genetic, your genes, your age, and your environment is hugely important. And this is how complex it is. It isn't simple. And if there's one message I want to give you here today, we don't know which child is going to become the great player. None of us know. There are so many things that impact on our genes. I spent the last 25 years looking at the impact of genetics on health, the impacts of genetics on exercise. We don't simply know. We, we, even with our fancy computer algorithms and com computational mathematics, we don't know. It is so complex. And you only have to look at the elite sporting academies across the water, the hundreds of players that go to Manchester United and Arsenal and Everton every year. How many of those hundred players who come in at 15, 16 ever make it? But all of a sudden, we're putting a label on these kids at 15 that they're going to be the superstars of the future. We simply don't know because it is, it is too complex. But what we can do we can create the environment that if they have the predisposition, the genetic predisposition to be a great player, we can create an environment. But that environment should be inclusive of all individuals across all ages, not just those who are wonderful at 12 or 13 or 14, but even beyond that. So here's the current model, the way a child develops. So zero to two is a child is an infant. Childhood is two to 12. Then we have adolescence, and this is adulthood. And if we place the GEA in context of this, we have our childhood games up to 12 years of age. Then we start developing our underage games, but now we start developing these development squads that have started to proliferate over the last 10 or 15 years. Then we have our minors is now 16 to 17, and under 20s is from 18 to 20. And then after that, we have our seniors. You know, there is some overlap between minors, under 21s, and seniors. So just to put it in perspective, that's sort of how we, how we, we analyze our games. So let's take a look at childhood first. That's zero to 12 years of age. The most important thing you can do as a coach during that years is look at the world through the eyes of a child, not through the eyes of an adult. These are children. And you have to ask yourself the question, why do children play our games? And if you ask yourself that question, I think you're heading in the right direction. They do it for lots of reasons. Number one, affiliation. They want to be part of a group. They want to make friends. Secondly, they want to learn new skills. Hugely important for kids. They want competitiveness. They want to be able to play in competitions. They want to feel success. And most importantly, for a child, they want to have fun. If you get that wrong, forget about it. If you don't come in with that ethos into your club, that should be the culture that pervades in your club. Because if you get that right, you will have a, a lot more kids competing and playing at under 14 or 15 if you take that as your mantra up to the age of 12. Because kids are like sponges. Kids will learn, their brains are hardwired to learn. And you have to create that environment to ensure that that happens. Think about learning. We all here learn to write at some stage in our life. That's a really complex task, actually. 
putting pen to a paper. Remember the first time you tried to write and it sprawls all over the place because it's complex. Your brain has to send a message down through your spinal cord to your hand to tell you how to write in the appropriate way. And in order to do that, you have millions, billions of nerve cells and they all talk to each other. You have around 60 trillion nerve cells in your body. And when a child is exposed to a wide ranging environment, these cells, they're activated, they're communicating all the time. And that's how kids learn skills. And all of this is hardwired to our brain. And there's no better time for doing this than when, 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 when they're children, between the ages of two and 12, and creating an environment to ensure that we maximize their ability to develop their skills. But unfortunately, learning to write is referred to as a closed skill. It's, very, it's, it's a very, very controlled environment and you decide when you want to start and when you want to finish writing. But if you look at sport, a young child playing camogie, Gaelic football, or hurling, they're complex sports. That's a lot more difficult than writing, believe you me. So these are called open motor skills, and they're performed in very unpredictable environments when you have an open motor skill. And the environmental context, when you play games, it's never the same every minute. The game is always changing. And what kids have to do is they have to learn to process information in real time during a game. That's very, very different than learning how to write. So if we go back, it's all of these things interacting with each other. That's what will ultimately will de will determine who is successful. Now, I put the following slide up many times before. If I put up all these individuals and I ask you which one of these individuals will become an elite, per an elite senior Gaelic football, hurler, camogie player? The simple answer is we don't know. Even with our total, our understanding, current understanding of molecular genetics, we simply don't know. In fact, we don't even know it's 16 and 17. But we're all the time making decisions as if we do know. And that's, I think, something that we really have to address as an association. So what, what should the environment be during childhood, during those two to 12 years of age? Well. We want to maximize the interaction between the, because they're, 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 they're growing, they're developing between the ages of two and 12. They have certain genes, and you want to create that environment to maximize that interaction. First of all, you've got to ensure full participation. That's number one. Number two, you've got to, to have playing in situations, and you've heard this today, and many of you already do this, you have to have reduced player numbers in our games. You have to reduce the playing area, and in doing that, that gives them more ball contacts, greater involvement, and great, that, what I call contextual processing. They get a, a hell of a lot more of that. Also, decision-making is also improved by allowing kids to play small games. But in the end, there are two things that really determine whether kids will keep coming back for, to training. And basically, that is enjoyment and perceived competence. They're the two key, study after study will tell us, they're the two reasons why kids want to come back. They want to have enjoyment, and they want to feel they can do it. They want to feel competent when they're actually doing it. And why is perceived competence or your, your, your perception that you feel you can do something, why is that important? Well, number one, it increases your enjoyment if, if you think you can do it. Number two, it improves your satisfaction. It improves your self-esteem. It develops your confidence. It improves your persistence. You'll continue to do it because you feel you're confident at doing it. And you'll expect success. And finally, you get lots more physical activity, and I'll come back to that later on. That's why it's important that we develop in, that enjoyment and perceived competence are hugely important. And we do that. We have our go games. And I have published hundreds of papers in genetics and vascular disease. The study I'm most proud of in my lifetime is being able to supervise Mickey Whelan's PhD in the go games. That study has greater implications in the public health of our nation than any vascular biology or genetics paper I will ever publish. Because we're affording every child in this country who comes to our clubs the opportunity to participate in our games through the Go Games. And all of those processes that, that are important for a child when they're developing, they get all of those in our Go Games. And it took a lot of battering to get the Go Games. Because the old, old school guys said, no, this is the way we always did it. Well, maybe we don't continue to do it all, the way we always did it. Maybe there's a better way. And the Go Games, I believe, have been a resounding success. I live out in Malahide, and I took this photograph one morning walking in Malahide Castle. There's six football pitches there, and every single kid was playing. The satisfaction I got out of seeing that photograph was immense. And you think of all of these things I talked about, their genes, their age, the environment, it's all interacting. That's the ideal scenario. 
And when I walked, I didn't take a photograph, unfortunately, of the other side of the hill. When I walked out of that hill and over into the other side where the soccer pitches were, there were three soccer games going on, and I counted on average there were 13 subs on each team. And I think they were probably around 12 years of age. Now, I know soccer have also developed this, but the, the, the point is, go games are the way to go. It's these small-sided games that affords all individuals the opportunity to play. What happens when we move to adolescence? This, this is becoming a really, really debatable point among the GEA community. Because during this phase, children are going through what we call puberty and the growth sport. And it's a tremendous time of change for both boys and girls. And it's something we have to take into account as coaches. And for the most part, we don't. Because all of these things, again, are interacting. If you look at biological age and chronological age, and if I take a 15-year-old, there can be a four-year difference either way. So that individual at 15 years of age can be four years biologically less developed or four years more developed. So a child at 15 years of age on your panel, some of them can still be in childhood developmentally, some can be in puberty, some can, can be going through the growth sport, and some are well into adolescence. And here is, I don't know if I have it here, here's an example of a photograph you can see there. The same team, there's one player in yellow, there's another player, and they're playing on the same team. Now, when we come to development squads in a moment, I don't have to, you only have to be an eye to figure out which of those two kids are gonna be picked on the development squad, okay? It certainly isn't gonna be Mickey Mouse, that's for sure, okay? And that's the problem, because all kids don't develop at the same rate. There's tremendous inter-individual variability. This is a picture taken as part of Mickey Whelan's PhD. This is one of the teams that took part in the study, and this is an under-16 team. Even at, under, at 16 years of age, look at the variability among all the players. What we have now is our development squads. This is what links into the adolescents with our minors and our under 20s. And it's this part here where I'm concerned. I'm a little bit concerned with what we're doing over the last number of years, particularly at county level. What we're doing is, even at this age, in your early teens or mid-teens, okay, we still, which of these kids here in the, in the previous slide are going to become elite players? We simply don't know, that's the answer. But all of a sudden, we're now starting to develop our, these development squads. And we're not basing it basic, based on any empirical evidence. We're basing it because we're picking precocious kids who develop early. Uh, they've been put on, onto squads. They're not necessarily long-term the players who are actually going to make it. But the problem is the kids who are not being selected, both at club level and at county level, they're dropping out of our game. So let's take an example here. Here's four club teams. So here's, what, no, here's what's happening at present. This, this would be, we perceive... On those four players, as a coach, we, we perceive each individual player and we come up with a certain perception of how good or how bad they are. So on average, some of them are certain percentage are classified as good, certain percentage are classified as fair, certain percent are very good, certain percentage are classified as poor, and then we have our future greats. At 15 years of age, we're identifying, oh yeah, it's these guys out here, these are the brilliant players. These are the guys that are going to be the great players, and I can tell at 15 or 14 or 16 years of age. And these are the guys that we're selecting onto our development squads. And that's wrong. Because all of the kids, the kids who you're classifying as fair, even as poor, they could be four years behind those kids biologically. And given the opportunity to, to, be, to stay in our games, those could end up being the best players that we have. But too many are dropping out. Because for many coaches, it's about instant gratification for the coaches rather than deferred gratification. Your enjoyment should be 10 years later, seeing the reward for the hard work that you put in many years earlier, to be able to say, I ensured that when I started, there were 25 kids playing. When I left, there were still 25 players, still members. That's the key. That's what we need to do a lot more in our association. Do we need development squads? Yes. But I think we need to take a good hard look at how they're run. And they've now, we have now have developmental squads competitions. That was never the purpose of these. And I think we really need to take a good hard look at that. And the reason these kids are being selected, because at that certain age, they have the unique right combination of genes, biological age, and environment. And that's why we're selecting them. And I just want to, to raise a flag on that. So we don't know which of these under-16 Dublin players are actually going to make it. We know over history how many All-Ireland winning players have gone on to play even at senior level inter-county. Even at minor level, we don't know what players. And again, you only have to look across the water at the development academies there. So the problem is, I don't have evidence for this. That's the hard thing. And this is so true when it comes to the GEA. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. 
And I believe, in fact, when I was living in America, I wrote to Sean McKay around 20 years ago now. And I said at the time that every single GEA player should have an electronic tag. And every single time that they play, that should be computed. And we should be able to track and find out when kids are starting to drop out of our sport. And we need empirical evidence about all these guys being put into development squads. Let's track them over 10, 15 years, and let's see how many are making it. That's what we need to start doing, because we're, we have developed these development, developmental academies based on no empirical evidence. We're basically copying what has been a huge failure in the United Kingdom. And I think we need to, to, to look at a different model. So folks, you need to take your head out of the sand. That's just the reality. We have our head deep buried in sand. So, and the problem is, as coaches, we talk about values, behaviors, and cultures. I believe many coaches have actually forgot what the hell the purpose of their job is, okay? You've got to know what the purpose of your job is. If you're supposed to be looking after the sheep, or the sheep looking after you, okay? You've got to figure out what your role here is. Your role is to ensure that those kids continue playing as long as they possibly can. That's your role. And if you do that, you're doing a wonderful job. Because even if you take a look here, we look after our minors, even up to under 20s. They're well looked after. But those kids on the fringes with small clubs, clubs that can't get enough numbers, and the whole idea of even combining teams or coming together to the same pitch and sharing players, that would be alien to some coaches. But I think Pat Daly, to, to be fair to him, has developed a number of, of issues in hurling here where we have semi-formal competitions that are effort-driven and they're mastery-orientated where we can actually share players to make sure that every player gets the opportunity to play. We have our goal games and also we have the super games. They've already been talked about here. But I want you to embrace those. We need to embrace those an awful lot more than we currently are embracing them. We've got to find ways to keep our kids. It's, they drop off a cliff at 14, 15 years of age. And particularly young girls. And we've really got to find a way to keep them involved in our sport. So finally, what I want to talk about is this healthy bodies, healthy minds. This is wonderful propaganda from the GEA. But in fact, if you go back to our values, by allowing a kid to drop out of our sport, at 12, 13, 14, before the age of 18, I believe we have failed the child. We're adults, and it's our responsibility to ensure that every single child is afforded the opportunity to participate. I don't care what level it is at. I'm talking about participation. You find the level that's appropriate for them and find a way for them to be able to participate. Because, you know, they'll surprise you in the long term if you keep them in the game. So what do I mean when we talk about healthy bodies, healthy minds? Well, we know that exercise is hugely important for children, for their overall health, their mental health, their physical health. It helps them maintain their body weight, their self-esteem, their sleep. Exercise is hugely important. But not just their physical health, but also their mental health. And Colin will talk to you about the whole notion of playing sport and, and what he sees from the level of what's happening in the schools. Look at mood, cognition, attitude, mastery, depression. All of these are positively affected by kids engaging in exercise. So every time the kid takes his bag and doesn't come back to your club because we have pushed them away, they're losing the opportunity to develop all of these wonderful psychological well-being traits. They're no longer good. And think of it if it was your child or your grandchild, what would you actually want? The problem with kids who live in the modern world, they're exposed to a very poor diet, to tobacco, alcohol, huge chronic stress, drug abuse, lack of sleep, and in my instance, lack of physical activity. These are the lifestyle risk factors that we spend 80% of our healthcare budget is treating chronic conditions because of these risk factors, believe it or not. In Ireland today, of our 19 billion spent this year, 80% will, will be spent treating chronic conditions. And we can prevent those by ensuring that our children become physically active at a young age. Because most children will develop their health behaviors before the age of 16. And they'll take those health behaviors with them for the rest of their lives. And health behaviors track. If you're physically active at 16 to 18 years of age, the likelihood you'll be physically active as an adult. It's recommended that every child in Ireland get 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. That's the equivalent to brisk walking. Currently in Ireland, 12% of 10 to 18 year olds meet that recommendation. Imagine, 12 out of every 100, 10 to 18 year olds in Ireland get the minimum amount of physical activity daily. And, the best, and we're turning them away from our clubs because we think winning is more important and we want to develop only the best. So select the best and neglect the rest. I think we need a different model. It's one in eight teenagers and one in five teenagers, uh, one in five, ten, one in five, ten to twelve year olds. That's the number that currently meet the physical activity recommendations. 
We know that if children start drinking at or before the age of 14, 40% of them will become alcoholics. That's a classic example of a health behavior before the age of 18. We know that 82% of current smokers start before the age of 18. We also know that 9 out of 10 people with substance abuse start before the age of 18. There are wonderful reasons, compelling reasons, for you to keep young kids involved in your club, to keep them playing sport. That there, is, there are more important things in life than winning an under 14 or under 15 competition. And the satisfaction you will get later in life is incalculable. Also, as I said already, kids who are physically active tend not to have, health, have poor health behaviors. They tend not to smoke, not to drink excessively, they tend to get good sleep, and they tend to have a better diet. So the likelihood of you have the kids participating in your clubs, they are going to be physically active. This is a study, I'm only going to show you two studies, but this is based on 1,317,000 kids in Sweden. That's a pretty big sample. And what they do in Sweden, you're conscripted into the military at 18. And at 18 years of age, they measured their, their aerobic capacity of all 1,300,000. And they followed the kids for 29 years, and there's what they found. The kids at 18 years of age, who were the, most, who were the, physically, who were the fittest at 18 years of age, they had the lowest risk of dying in the next 30 years. They also looked at heart attacks, the very, very same. The kids who were the highest, the highest fit kids at 18 years of age had the 35% lower incidence of heart disease, of dying from a heart attack. Guys, I mean, there's the message. That's what we were set up for in the first place. It was an outlet for the, uh, the Irish people in rural and urban Ireland to be able to go and play. It was a recreational outlet, and we have turned it into something totally different over the last 10 to 15 years. Also, the kids, we, they live in a different world than we grew up in a totally different world with social media, the pressures that they're under, and the mental anguish that's causing many, many kids. And we know the kids who are physically active, it decreases the risk of becoming depressed in the first place. And even if you are depressed and you're physically active, you actually 40% decrease in relapse rate if you're physically active. So again, hugely important. I really want to impress upon you. And this is a study that I did myself. I didn't want to show it to you, but I took a group of 15-year-old kids, transition your kids in this country, and I showed that the kids who were the, the least active kids, that they had a vascular age of 65. And they're 15 years of age. So if you have an, an inactive 15-year-old in your club or sitting in your classroom, the likelihood is they have a vascular age of 60 years of age. And Pat Daly has been talking about this whole concept of well-being. We need to get back to that. That's what the association was about in the first place. We need to develop... As a coach, you need to create and maintain an ecosystem, a culture that affords every single child the opportunity to play. And that's, I, I couldn't put it any better than Stan McChrystal, who was the head of the Allied forces in, 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 in the beginning of, the, of the, this century in the Middle East with the United States. He said that many leaders are tempted to, to lead like a chess master, striving to control every move when they should be leading like a gardener. You've got to create and maintain a viable ecosystem. That's the challenge I'm giving to all of you. That's what you should be doing as a coach. Because you know something, people may not remember exactly what you did or what you said, but years from now, many of the children who you're coaching, they will always remember how you made them feel. And that's a very, very important lesson for all people who are involved with young coaches. And I'm going to finish off with this story. And it's one of my favorite stories in sport. I spent the last two and a half days in the RDS as a judge at the Young Scientist. The resilience of kids is amazing. If you give kids the opportunity, my first year when I was a judge on it, it was a little girl from a school in Dublin. She was a first year, she did this phenomenal study. It was that complicated, they didn't even understand it, but we, we, got, we got to the gist of it. And I said to her, what have you learned from this experience? And this little 12 year old girl looked up at me and she said, I realize I can do anything at 12 years of age. Don't underestimate what kids can do. But if you don't give them the opportunity, you're letting something unique pass. And that finish, I'm going to finish off with Wilmer Rudolph. If you think kids, if you just give them the opportunity, they'll grasp it. And this lady is the best example that I know of. She was born in 1940. She was the 20th of her father's 22 children from two marriages. She was African-American living in America in the 1940s. And because she was African-American, she was turned away from her local hospital the night her mother wanted to give birth. And she, her mother gave birth to her at home, and she was nursed to health by her family. But they lived in abject poverty in Tennessee. And by the age of four, Wilma, Rula, Wilma Rudolph contracted the measles, the mumps, 
scarlet fever, chicken pox, and pneumonia. She overcame every single one of them. Every single one of them. Against all the odds, she overcame them all. But at the age of four, she contracted infantile paralysis from polio. She developed, a, she was contracted poliomyelitis, the virus. For her, she recovered from the virus, but she was told she would never walk again. Imagine at four years of age being told you would never walk again. Don't underestimate the resilience of children. That's her. Take a look at that photograph and etch that in your memory. Imagine a four year, look at her leg. And in order to walk, she had to wear braces. She would never walk properly again. And her mother put her on a bus and took her 80 kilometers back and forward to an African-American hospital where she could get physiotherapy. And she taught her siblings her, her, how, to give, how to also give Wilmoth physiotherapy. So she got daily massages on her leg and against the wishes of her doctors, she took off the braces when she was nine. And believe it or not, by the age of 12, Wilma Rudolph learned to walk again. Her mother was her coach. Her mother didn't give up on her the way that so many of us give up on our kids. And it's amazing when we, she stuck with Wilma, Wilma turned out to be a pretty good performer after all. Don't underestimate the resilience of a child. And finally, this is the first American female athlete to win three Olympic gold medals at the Olympic Games. To get to the Olympic Games, you have to be pretty good. But to go to the Olympic Games and to win three gold medals in the 100 meters, the four by 100 meter relay, and the 100 meters. This is her crossing the line to win the Olympic 200 meters to become the fastest woman on earth. Now you have to be pretty special to do that. Folks, that is Wilma Rudolph. Think about that for a moment. Wilma Rudolph just didn't learn to walk again. She became the fastest woman on earth. And our clubs are full of Wilma Rudolphs, the kids who you think don't have the talent that we brush aside. They didn't develop early. Believe you me, your club are full of Wilma Rudolphs, but we don't give them the opportunity. I'm begging you, create a culture that's inclusive, that every child is afforded the opportunity to play our wonderful games. Don't clip their wings too early, okay? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colin O'Rourke. I'm afraid that uh, some of the speakers have left me in the shade and have said most things that need to be said here today, particularly by Niall. But I'm happy that at least some people have waited to the end because it reminded me of we were playing Galway in a league match about 25 years ago in Tune Stadium and we went down before the game and there was a colleges match on between St. Pat's and uh, St. Charlotte's. And there was a brilliant crowd at the game. We went in to tug out, and when we came back out for the game, there was nobody there. They all had gone home. So that's what they thought of Mead and Galway at the time. And I couldn't help but think of Wilmar Rudolph. We had a Wilmar Rudolph as well. He was called Mick Lyons. We tempted them down from the mountain with raw meat and <laughs> threw, him, threw him a ball. And eventually, he ended up winning on All-Ireland. So, there are quite a few examples of that in the GEA as well. well I just, I, I, and I suppose, and aside from that, I, I couldn't help but think this morning when I read the paper and I saw that Pat Lane had died, and God be good to him, he was a great referee, a fantastic referee, because he allowed us bait all round us out here. <laughs> so when, wherever he goes to the referee, heaven, I hope that he gets pride of place up there. God be good to him. I, I was trying to work out when Pat said to me about values and beliefs and culture, and I didn't even understand that much about what they were about. And for most people, the idea of a big, thick mead man talking about culture is a bit rich anyway. But we'll, I'll do my best on a few of these things. I haven't got the gizmos that Niall have, has. I didn't want, because I'm only going to speak for 10 minutes. And I'm a bit like the cavern man I do, uh, who only trusts cash. I don't trust these things to work. <laughs> they generally break down on me on the big day. So I just wanted to talk about the idea of what we talk about values. And what basically we're talking about is standards of behavior, which are important in life. And I suppose our culture is the type of characteristics or features of our race, of our nation. And 
uh, the conduct is the way that we like to behave towards others and to ourselves. But values is something which is universal. I remember saying to one of the Muslims in school one day, what are your values? And he, sa he said, well, tolerance, respect, uh, a degree of empathy towards others, uh, willingness to help those in trouble, and he thought about them for a while, and he said basically all the things that we would say. So what we think of in the GEA are, are the sort of universal values that maybe we should live our lives by. And our, we can be optimistic, we can be pessimistic, we can be trusting, we can be aggressive, assertive, or passive. These are all the characteristics of different things. But my involvement has been, I, I started my 41st year coaching in second level schools. And I'm not the brightest fellow in the world, but I did pick up a few things over those 41 years in dealing with young people and the way that young people have changed. And Niall summed up a lot of the things that I feel strongly about through my experience over those number of years. And coaching forums like this are fantastic. And it brings about organization. And when I looked at Eamon Fitzmaurice and the degree of professionalism that he brought to the management of the Kerry team, well, it just was something that was way beyond what we would have experienced or I would have experienced. And even down to the extent of the, day, the, the nightly planning of sessions. So like that is bringing things to a whole new uh, level of professionalism than what we are used to. And forums like this bring people together and the organization of coaching has improved dramatically, dramatically, thanks to people like Pat and these coaching conferences. But there's always one caveat in the back of my mind that always grates and Niall played, on a, a played it there, the idea of play, play, and in all its forms, in all its wildness that it should bring for young people, and the fact that we have to allow them to be individual and not to coach something out of them, but to put something extra in. And there is the danger with highly organized coaching structures that that bit of madness that's there in people is coached a way out of them. In school, you know, people are concerned about young people and I'd have a lot of worries and concerns, but in general, they are tolerant and respectful and courteous and friendly and display a lot of the qualities that you would like to have with your own children. But Sometimes, in a football context, there has to be a bit of wildness about an individual to bring out the best in them, and we should never uh, coach that out of a person. And sometimes they may be difficult, and sometimes they great with us, and sometimes we'd be inclined to tell them to go home and not come back again. But there's that bit of wildness that I see in young people I think, which is something that often brings the best out of others later on as well. Don't have them passive. Don't have them aggressive, but allow them to be expressive and express their own personal qualities because one size does certainly not fit all when it comes to school. The biggest danger in coaching and in dealing with young people that I have come across, particularly in the last five years, is that one thing there. I think in 50 years, people will be doing PhDs and studies and saying to themselves, how did parents and people allow so many young people to have a nuclear missile like that in their hand 24 hours a day without anybody really controlling it. And we have a rule in school, if you're caught with your phone during the day, it's taken off you for a week. And 
when a person, it's a great example of what it means to a young person when somebody gives me their phone and they arrive up and the weeping and gnashing of teeth over it is unbelievable. And I often say to them that it's a great example of two words of the English language and knowing the difference between them because they will arrive up in a state of high anxiety to say, I need my phone. And I always say, you're going to learn now the difference between need and want. I want my phone. You don't need your phone. I do need my phone. I have to arrange a lift home. I'm going to training tonight. I don't know what time the session will be at and whatever. And I say, I'll ring your coach for you and find out. And that, of course, is never acceptable. I have to get a lift home. I'll ring your mother. That's not acceptable, too. And then I say to them really stupidly, of course, when I was your age, I had no phone, and I was able to get to training and things like that, and they say, oh, my God, I'm dealing with a dinosaur here. <laughs> and the other discussions that I have become having more and more often with parents of young people over the last five years, because I think this tsunami has only hit us in the last five years. And I had a lady in my office recently, and her son is 14 years old. And I said to her, and she knew a bit of what was coming, but she didn't know the whole lot. And she, I said to her, do you know that your son is having regular sex with a number of girls? And then I said, on top of that, he is drinking heavily, and he is smoking hash. And if you wanted to see the blood draw drain out of a woman's face, then this was the best example that you could give. Not only that, but he was one of the best footballers in the school. So people think that maybe we are being insulated from the dangers of the world because we have very good active uh, football clubs. Better, better, better than ever before. Our clubs are better. The type of personnel in our clubs are better. The level of coaching is better. The quality of people is better. We have a great model at that level. But there are inherent dangers to it as well. And the phone and the access to the type of material that they have on their phone and for young people who have parents. And if anybody thinks their son or their daughter doesn't be part of this social scene, then you're being naive. I have been woken up to it very much in the last few years, that there is a different type of lifestyle that young people. Now, we can solve that problem, but what we can have is a model of behavior in our clubs, which at least is helpful to them. I certainly would, have been, would be increasingly concerned about the trend in human behavior, in just human behavior, about the ethical and moral standards of young people going forward. And what's everything is transient and there's instant gratification in many respects. And I would be looking ahead and saying, what are these 15, 16, 17 year olds going to be like when they're 27, when they're 37? Will they hold down a good job? Will they be able to have a stable relationship? Or is everything going to be temporary? And get a new phone, get a new girlfriend, get a new boyfriend, I'll change my sport or whatever. And then every year we have a leaving cert mass where we have 170 or 80 fellas where they come up and they get awards at the end of the year. And I just look at them and I think to myself, I have never seen better quality of young people. So what we as adults need to do with them as people and as young players is to make sure that we retain our confidence in them and try to give them proper direction. And that proper direction is involved in coaching and matches and being res respectful and tolerant towards them. Something, I have to say, I'm not always that way myself on the line of a pitch. And there was a couple of games this year when I give a lash to a few fellas and shift your feckin' arse, will you, bitches, and go for the bloody ball. We're all like that. But at least you spend the time with them. 
give them time, give them confidence, make them feel better about themselves, and they will probably be all right. But it is a difficult thing. It is difficult. It's not just a simple thing anymore. You say, right, okay, we're going to play games and that's it. And yet in St. Pat's I see more people playing, a greater interest in the GEA, a greater willingness to take part. Unfortunately, in our school, what we have experienced over the last 10 years is more people playing, greater participation, and we're winning much less. Now, I don't know why. But like in the noughties, we were able to win Leinster championships easily from a far lower number of players. But if you ask somebody, which is better? A bigger number of people playing now, much greater participation, and a much greater willingness of young people to become involved in their clubs as secretaries, as treasurers, as referees, as committee members, back to a time where we had less playing but we were far more successful and we won Leinster's and won all Ireland's. I still think greater numbers playing is a better model. And the elitism is something that I'm not particularly impressed with. And my good friends in the GPA and myself differ on this quite a bit. What we need is, we need to be the communist organization of the next century. And the GEA is that, where everybody's equal and where everybody pulls together and we're all the same. For me, there is no contradiction in life between private wealth and private affluence and then public responsibility and a public system like the GEA where we have a socialist type of organization. There is no conflict. But what we have to be concerned about is that personal wealth and personal affluence then mixes and taints the great organization that it becomes a capitalist organization based on elitism where we don't have the big numbers participating and the big numbers pushing it in all its aspects. So from my school point of view, I see great hope for the future, for the future of the GEA in terms of the values and the behaviours and the cultures because these young people respect our game, respect our culture, respect what we're at, but definitely what we need is we need to mind them very carefully because they're not as tough, as resilient as, the <clears throat> as they used to be, but they are still brilliant young people and all they need to do, as Niall says, is to be given their opportunities. Thank you all.